Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of Market Mondays. My name is Seng Yao, and I will be your host and moderator for today. This week, volatility is the name of the game for capital markets. Over the last few trading sessions, US indices have already dropped between 1% to 2% following the hotter-than-expected consumer inflation report released last Wednesday. This has changed the outlook for the Fed's rate cut cycle and also rekindled the view that the US dollar will stay stronger for longer, which would also mean weaker demand for Asian currencies and assets in the short run. Notwithstanding the scenario of a stronger for longer USD, we believe this is unlikely to reverse the direction of the US markets in our view. Last week, we saw that selling was very broad-based with all 11 sectors of the S&P 500 declining for the first time since September. Banking shares led the selling spree as uh, banks re reported first quarter earnings. The largest banks basically issued muted forecasts as they were starting to feel the pinch of the higher for longer interest rates and tighter net interest margin spreads. On an intraday basis, JP Morgan shares declined 6.5%, uh, which was the stock's worst day since June 2020, uh, while Citigroup basically fell 1.7%. Uh, now, Middle East tensions are not helping sentiment either. After Israel and Allied defenses intercepted more than 300 Iranian missiles and drones, Asia-Pacific markets are down midday, and we do not think the selling pressure is anywhere near over. Two significant questions now remain, which will definitely add a new layer of unpredictability. A, what will Israel's response be? And B, how military proxies in Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq might potentially join Iranian efforts to target Israel again. While Brent oil prices are now stable at about 90 US dollars per barrel, uh, this is based on this morning's data, but there are now legitimate concerns that sustained higher oil prices could add more fuel to global inflationary pressures. So on this note, I'd like to invite our first panelists onto the call to first talk about inflation and interest rates. We know that US CPI was one significant factor that spooked markets last week, but the Fed's preferred inflation gauge is not the CPI, but the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. And to get a sense of the upcoming March PCE data that will be released on 26th of April, I've asked uh, Winston Poon uh, to come onto the call. Winston heads our fixed income research team. Winston, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, after last Friday's surprisingly strong, uh, last week's surprisingly strong US CPI data, market players have begun slashing the Fed, uh, the Fed Reserve, um, uh, the Fed rate cut bets, uh, and we've seen that swap traders now see around forty-three basis points of cuts uh, from the Fed in twenty twenty-four versus roughly sixty-five basis points before the C the CPI release. Uh, the direction of the PCI, uh, the PCE data will will be influenced to some extent by wholesale prices, and these prices or the producer price uh, index, uh, in short, uh, has shown continued month to month deceleration uh, when the last set of results was uh, were released. What's your outlook for the March PCE data uh, set, uh, and do you think credit markets will put more weight to the March PCE data? or the April PCE data in light of the Middle East developments. Winston? Hi, uh, morning, Seng Yao. Um, um, afternoon. Um, I think the lower PPI data, as you shared earlier, came as a small relief, at least to the bonds and rates market after the hot uh, CPI print. Um, as you mentioned, the next key inflation data is uh, PCE uh, next Friday. As we know, PCE is the Fed uh, preferred measure of inflations. Um, I think we expect PCE, core PCE, to come in at about 0.3% um, month on month, mm. um, same as um, February, uh, but slightly lower compared to 0.4% uh, in January. So I think the overall picture for US inflation is still going to be one that shows a gradual easing, but hasn't reached a level for the Fed to actually start rate cut with um, confidence and as you pointed out, certainly there are risks uh, from the Middle East um, conflicts. And we recall the energy spike in 2022 was actually made worse by the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, war, in addition to the COVID disruptions. Uh, Brent crude prices are up by almost 20% year-to-date, 
And as we know, energy price fits into everything, food, clothing, a phone, whether directly or indirectly. So we'll monitor the situation. Right, right. So just kind of like uh, based on the available data that you have at this moment, do you expect the Fed to be making three cuts this year, two cuts, or, or, two, or some even say none at all uh, for 2024? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And market sentiment, market pricing on this, unfortunately, changes uh, from day to day, um, week to week. If you look at the last FOMC dot plot in March, uh, it was still guiding for three rate cuts in total this year. Um, but market pricing has already come down to less than two um, compared to a total of six to seven cuts um, just in January. And the hawkish repricing, I would say, is uh, understandable because the U.S. labor market is strong and inflation, even though it has come down, but it's still some distance away from the Fed's uh, 2% goal. Uh, but uh, given where the Fed funds rate is at about 5.5%, uh, real rate is high. I think certainly the Fed has room to cut, but the, the Fed has no urgency to cut and they can afford to wait. So if you look at the next meeting in May, uh, FOMC, I think it's unlikely to see any change. Uh, June, the FOMC meeting, the chances is also looking slim. It looks more likely to be in third quarter and the market is pricing for first rate cut to come in uh, September uh, currently. Uh, recently, if you look at the comments by the Atlanta Fed president, uh, Bo Stake, uh, he himself is looking for a total of one rate cut only in uh, 2024. But I think we need to be careful uh, in taking the current market pricing at face value uh, because sentiment can change quite drastically uh, within a relatively short period of time. Uh, just for example, nine months ago in mid-2023, uh, the market was still dovish, uh, recovering from the US regional banking crisis. Uh, six months ago, in October, the market was very hawkish. Uh, three months ago in January, the market turned dovish again because of the dovish FOMC statement. And now the market is looking hawkish, but I think there is a decent chance that this may not last for more than three to five months. I see. Okay. Wow. So quite a fair bit of uh, uh, changes to to expect for until the end of this year. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. All right. But uh, uh, Winston, maybe one last question uh, on the rates front. Um, you know, we take this all back and look at uh, uh, UST, which is the US government bonds versus the ASEAN uh, government bonds. What's your tactical view uh, for this asset class? We like the current treasury uh, yields have reprised uh, meaningfully higher. I would say the current two year treasury yields of around 4.9% uh, is a buy uh, gradually. For investors who are willing to take some credit risk, there are better you pick up in credits, a single A rated US corporate bonds, about two year tenors offering uh, above 5.5% in yield. The current sell off, I would say, also offer a window of opportunity for investors to extend some durations. So within ASEAN government bonds, um, we are actually selective. We like Singapore SGS, the Singapore government bond. The 10-year SGS yield uh, currently is about 330, 335. Uh, it's not far from the 3.5% peak in October last year. And even at the very short end, if you look at the T-bill, the last option cutoff yield was 3.75%. Uh, it's a very good alternative to cash. Uh, but um, whereas for Malaysia government bonds, I would say the MGS yield are not looking very compelling at the moment because a ringgit bond hasn't really seen much sell-off. It has been very resilient. And having said that, uh, if it does offer some stability and is a very important asset class for institutional investors when it comes to ringgit asset locations. A 10-year yield is about 4%, uh, which still offers a good pickup from the 3% uh, OPR. Uh, last but not least uh, for Indonesia, we are actually slightly cautious uh, because even though the Indo-GB rupiah bonds is very high yielding, what we have to understand that um, Bank Indonesia is one of the uh, regional cent central banks that is most sensitive. The policy rate is most sensitive to the US rates pricing. Uh, last October, they had a surprise rate hike. 
I don't think there's a line in the sand in terms of dollar rupiah at what level they will hide rate. But additional sell-off in US rates, hawkish repricing, I think will increase the chances for a BR rate hike. Great. Thank you very much for that, Winston. And we'll leave it at that uh, on the rates front. Um, I'm going to basically invite uh, my next uh, speaker onto the show. Uh, and uh, we're going to basically start taking a look at the charts. Uh, Nick, who heads our regional uh, uh, technical research desk, uh, will basically first um, help us understand uh, what the FTSE ASEAN uh, index uh, currently looks like. Uh, Nick, uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Um, Hi. Yeah. Could you, you please uh, walk us through your observations on the FTSE ASEAN, please? All right. Okay. So this is a follow up from uh, what we've been highlighted last week. So if you look on the screen, the index is actually we are expecting further consolidation. Uh, largely last week we there is a pretty much a short trading week after a two days break in Malaysia, Indonesia, and one day break in uh, Singapore due to uh, IDFT celebration. So that actually um pretty much resulted in the software demand. Uh, for the region, uh, regional equity market. The first session, if you look on the screen, it was actually uh, rebounded, although the, the rebound was pretty much kept within 10 can line. 10 can line on the screen, if you look, there are one single line, uh, the blue color, that are actually the representation of the short-term trend. So those two, actually, uh, the 10 can and the Kijun line, the blue and red color, is actually pretty much a representation of the short-term trend, whereas if, this, if the price unable to search beyond those level, it was considered uh, quite bearish. So in terms of the overall movement, um, the trend structure since uh, November last year is pretty still, uh, I would say, quite supportive, although we're expecting the ongoing consolidation to continue. So uh, this is actually in line with our uh, previous expectation. So we're expecting the full action to continue to drift um, lower, at least near term, testing our immediate support at 10,200 and the psychological support of 10,000. So if you look reaction as per today, it was down about uh, over 1%, largely due um, gap down move in the uh, Malaysia market. Um, I think uh, it's quite the decline in a Singapore market is quite soft, but the rest like Indonesia, um, Vietnam, Philippines uh, have quite uh, what we call it, uh, a little bit more uh, decline compared uh, the rest. That's, Nick, one question. If this support level breaks, what's the next support level that uh, we would be looking at? Now, the thing is, I do think that the current support level at at least within these two zones, 10,000 to 10,000, is going to be quite uh, strong. Uh, we have a strong buffer with this current level, which means if this level has been taken out, the long-term uh, bias is going to change from ongoing, currently uptrend, and into uh, at least into a neutral. So the next uh, support level should be right uh, way below at six, uh, 9,600. So that is additional 400 points from the current uh, support level. But uh, at the moment, I think that the downside um, could be kept within the psychology level of 10,000 because we've seen quite a number of the support at least, um, you know, at the current, at the level that I mentioned. Yeah. So that means if you expecting further consolidation, um, perhaps one way to look at it is we are looking to, um, for, you know, um, buying on the weakness, particularly at the support level. Right. Okay. Um, what's your view on the uh, SDI then, uh, medium term view? Um, SCI is still pretty much ranging, I think, in terms of the how um, the index move based on our recent report, um, the immediate support since at 3,095 and 3,260. So those levels have been tested a number of times, at least for this year. So I think at least if you look on the momentum reading, uh, others indicator, it doesn't showcase any uh, that strong um, resurgence in terms of the demand, so that could be kept uh, in terms of the how um, the index going to be pay out. So I, I think in in the short term we are expecting more on the sideways movement, uh, particularly within those two uh, support and resistance level. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, let's talk about uh, stock picks uh, for Singapore. Then, what are your top two um, uh, stocks? What are the top two stocks that you're looking at uh, for Singapore market? Now, in light what happened uh, as per yesterday, um, when you know the the heightened geopolitical risk, so we are actually looking um using our um in-house uh quant uh style, we are actually looking to focus on the more on the value stock. So the value stock which have quite a decent uh 
scoring. So the first one that pop out the name is uh, China Aviation Oil uh, Singapore. So if you look on the screen, the stock price is remain, I would say, pretty much on uptrend. The baseline was nice. It will build within this, uh, the red color line that represents by 200 day moving average. So the long-term trend is still pretty much uh, ongoing. So what we like is how the stock price is actually challenging the recent high and there's a decent chance for the those levels going to, to be taken out soon. Of course, as for today, it was a little bit, um, you know, uh, on the pullback mode, but I think in terms of structure, it's remain on the uh, stay on the upside. If you look the trend of the RSI, you can see how the RSI is actually rising up above this long term average line, indicating that overall momentum remain elevated. MACD also positive, and um, if you look on trading volume, also quite softer. So because of that, we expecting the uh, you know, the trend to continue with the short to medium term to target is actually back slightly higher at one point zero two and one point one six dollar. That's the first one. All right. Um, the second also we are looking at a similar uh side of value uh square value um is China Sunside uh, chemical um now the the what is the chart you look on the screen is actually a weekly chart so the reason I look on weekly chart because I want you to take a look on the the bigger structure of the trend while well, since June um 2022 it was you know in the downtrend but what make interesting is this um the stock unable to you know uh coming down beyond the yeah, current support which is actually sit at 45 cent um sorry 45 cents. So that means those levels have been tested a number of times over the past 12 months, you know, giving you strong indication that the selling pressure is actually quite weak, particularly within the support level. Um, if you look on the screen, there's also a normal Fibonacci 61.8 over there. And because of that repeated testing over that, uh, we can tell that um, the selling pressure has been pretty much as now. So what we're expecting right now is a possible change in terms of the overall trend. Of course, we want to uh, have more validation that, but for now, I think at the current level it gives us quite significant or uh, attractive uh, in terms of the risk reward ratio because accumulation at the current level give you quite um you know not really big uh, downside versus the potential upside that can offer by the stock price um so that that's that's what we're looking at do stock that we look at for this week okay great thanks very much for that uh, nick now we're going to stay uh in the uh singapore market and i'm going to basically invite uh, my third speaker onto the show right now um so the context of uh, the next topic is is um, uh, going to be on the property sector. Um, here uh, in Singapore, we saw first Q advanced GDP coming in better than expected. Partly, this was basically due to the uh, Taylor Swift uh, effect. Um, now, the potential recovery of manufacturing coupled with the inbound arrivals from China, um, um, basically the macro team, the Maybank's uh, macro team feel that this is all going to be positive tailwinds for the economy. And they've upgraded the 2024 GDP uh, targets to 2.4% uh, from 2.2% uh, previously. Now, we think that this momentum should have positive tailwind on our high conviction opportunity plus stock, uh, LHN, uh, which is basically Singapore's largest co-living uh, operator by a number of room keys. Now, Chia Lin has just reiterated her buy call uh, following a major tender win and a healthy pipeline of projects that is set to accelerate earnings to 18% uh, this year versus negative 1% last year. So Chia Lin, um, you are convinced that this stock is worth 30% more. Can you walk us through the uh, revenue drivers uh, for LHN and why do you consider its asset light business model to be a strength? Jalin? Yeah. Uh hi, Sen Yao, uh, and uh hi audience. Uh thanks for having me here. Um so uh uh thanks for, for uh the catch up uh on this uh refresher on this name. So for those of you who didn't follow this company all along, Aurition is a co-living operator with the largest market share uh with other business operation in space optimization facility management and renewable energy so the highlight from recent news flow is really on contract wings and the additional co-living units in singapore um Ocean has expanded at a very fast pace since entering the co-living space and has set a target of adding 800 keys each year so delivering on the additional keys will definitely add up to the top line. Um, Elevation entered our first year of its financial year in January with uh, slightly over 2,100 keys. And recent wins of MOH hostels and Fukushima fire station 
grow at over 400 kit, which marks half of this year's growth target. And these projects are expected to start contributing to its revenue towards the second half of this year and first half of next year. Um, and behind that growth, we are seeing more and more these buildings in contrast to acquiring buildings in the past few years. So for example, the two projects we have mentioned are all leased instead of owned. So I think it is consistent with what the management has committed to do. And also we are seeing a potential project with a JV partner to share the cost. So all in all, we think LHA is working towards its asset like life strategy. Okay, great. Now, Jalen, we spoke uh, a fair bit earlier that uh, this is uh, likely going to be a risk of environment for some time. Can you also walk us through uh, what are the downside swing factors for LHN stock price? Yeah, of course. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, LHN uh, as a colleague player, it definitely shares some commonality with service apartments and hotel market. Um, so risk and occupancy are definitely a factor that we can expect to uh, treat the top line, whether it's upward or downward. Um, so far this year, occupancy is largely stable at about 90%. Uh, rental risk, uh, of course, uh, will fluctuate to reflect the market conditions. Well, uh, as we all know, residential market saw a uh, softening since last end of last year, uh, and the hospitality market, on the other hand, was uh, benefiting from a confluence of factors such as cultural events, uh, China visa free from January through March. So, co-living sector, uh, in our opinion, will lie somewhere in the middle of that range. Um, and maybe uh, just for some uh, upside catalyst that we we find may happen, um, we know that MOH has put up more hostel sites for tender and uh, LHN is uh, interested to tender for more. And uh, interest rate, of course, is another big swing factor. Um, well, now we are talking about US reflation and how many rate cuts we should be expecting this year. Uh, but interest rates, in Singapore did uh, you know, uh, drop a little bit from its peak late last year. Um, and LHN has uh, had did some refinancing over that period. So we could potentially find a little bit of interest savings over there. Okay, great. Well, just to remind the audience again, what is the uh, debt gearing profile of uh, LHN? Uh, yes, so uh, for LHN, uh, it's gearing definitely not on the low side, but has been quite stable for the past few years. So the latest, uh, the latest last financial year, uh, it's gearing stood at 56%. Uh, and before that, uh, it, it's always hovering at uh, 50, around 55%. And earlier in 2020, it was at over north of 57%. So we could we could see that the management is uh, disciplined in maintaining, at least maintaining at this level. Okay, great. And finally, uh, if we look at the company's valuation, uh, how does this, uh, how does LHN compare to its uh, peers? Okay, so uh, for uh, LHN as a co-living player, unfortunately, there is not, uh, there is no exact uh, comparable for it in, uh, within the listed space. Um, but uh, we could look at some um, some uh, dividend paying hospitality rates for reference. So hospitality rates, this sector generally trades at a thirty percent discount to book. Uh, for example, some names that pop up will be a uh, class uh, as cop uh, class um, trading at twenty percent discount uh, and which yields a three point six percent dividend. Uh, Far East Hospitality Trust trading at 40% discount, yielding 7% dividend. So you can roughly see that uh, this is the range uh, that the sector trades at. And for LGN per se, it, uh, its current uh, price to book value stands at 0 0.62 times. Uh, so that's uh, trading at uh, around uh, 35 to 38% discount. Okay, great. We have a question from the floor from Mr. Yen Yap. 
Mr. Yenyap is uh, asking, is uh, LHN's contract with MOH a multi-year one? And uh, and what kind of rate is it uh, fixed at? Is it fixed rate or is it a variable rate? Uh, uh, is is I think he's trying to also understand whether there is any price escalations built into the contracts. Okay. Um, uh, I think uh, for LHN uh, lease with uh, MOH, definitely a multi-year one. Um, uh, that's why we, we will expect a certain number of KPEX for this project. Um, uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, if memory serves, uh, this list should be a master list with six rates. Uh, so, so you wouldn't be uh, expecting any uh, sudden uh, search night like, uh, like other hotel properties that they own. Um, so uh, that, that will be the structure of this list. Uh, in terms of price escalation, unfortunately, the management hasn't disclosed on that. But uh, entering into first half uh, uh, result season, uh, we will definitely chat with the management on this. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So we'll leave it Thank at you. that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for um, having so me. Thanks. As a final idea to share, uh, we've also just released our latest uh, thematic research on Malaysia. The details of the report is actually contained in the QR code uh, at the end of this uh, presentation uh, uh, deck. Uh, so overall, uh, our research shows that the market seems to be rotating away from small caps and back in the value and low volatility style stocks. Uh, in light of the Middle East developments, we also think the Malaysian market may be a tad more resilient than its ASEAN peers. And here we're basically using the 1990 Gulf War as a benchmark. Now, ASEAN countries uh, such as Thailand and Philippines, which were largely more dependent on oil imports, uh, they experienced negative impact um, uh, due to the surge in, in oil prices. But markets like Malaysia and Indonesia benefited from the high oil prices. Uh, and during the Gulf War, the MSCI in Malaysia actually gained 2.8% from start to the end of the war. Uh, Malaysia remains a net oil, oil exporter, and we look at uh, the MSCI Malaysia's valuations, it's still very, fairly valued at 14 times forward PE versus the five-year mean of 15 times. So if the risk of environment perpetuates, we think it could hold out slightly better than other, other uh, ASEAN peers. Uh, for Malaysia, our top picks are Hong Leong, Hong Leong Bank and uh, Nestle Malaysia. All right. So with that... Uh, we're going to, we've come to the end of the uh, program and we're going to, just going to basically leave you with these uh, ideas. Uh, just to run through briefly, uh, there will be uh, two events that will be coming up um, uh, towards the end of the month. Um, and first one is, is actually on the 17th of uh, April. And uh, this is basically a talk uh, hosted by Lion Global uh, on income and uh, growth funds. So if uh, you want to find out a bit more, kindly sign on to the uh, bit.ly link and uh, uh, register your interest to basically attend this uh, event. All right. So uh, with that, we're, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for your participation this uh, lunchtime. And we hope to see you again uh, next uh, Monday. Thank you.